Let's give the Spirit of God a bigger hand. Story. 
you're going to find out that there's much more substance to his story uh, than you think there is. And I want to help us unpack that because if we can get why Noah built the ark and how he built it, then you and I are going to understand how to build our lives. And it's very important how we build our lives. Because when storms come, we want our lives to remain firm. We don't want to be shaken. We don't want to fall off the wayside. We don't want to fall away from God. Amen. We want to stay firm in God. How about, because here's the reality. Here's why I want to stay firm in God. And I don't know if this is the same. I don't know if this is what you would say. But I don't want to serve a God who's, who created the heavens and the earth and who created me, who's all-powerful, all-knowing, and just only accomplished things in my human strength. If I serve a God who is big and mighty and strong, how in the world am I going to point to Him if I'm building things that are only built by what, by, in my strength or what other men have accomplished? You understand what I'm saying? What's going to set you, your life apart from just saying I'm a Christian or being a believer in Christ as to someone who actually has substance to their life, to where you are constantly building a testimony in your life to where the power of God is shown. Because here's the reality. I don't want to give you a bunch of testimonies that I accomplished in my own strength. That does nothing except point to me. I need a, a testimony built in life that points to Him. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. And if we do not allow God to build a testimony in our life, then all you will ever do is point to yourself. But let me tell you something. In order for Him to build a testimony in yourself, uh, in your life, that that uh, where His power can be seen, it requires faith. It requires hope. It requires love. It requires getting put in crazy situations and where His arm is the only one that can rescue you. Yes, sir. Not many of us are willing to say yes to that kind of stuff. Not many of us are willing to empty our bank accounts when God says to give. Not many of us are willing to face preaching whenever you're, you know, in the midst of danger because we're afraid of our own safety. Not many of us are willing to be obedient to God because it makes us uncomfortable. But it takes faith to please God. You want to build an ark? You want to be able to stay afloat when the winds and the rains and the storms and the floodwaters come? Because I'm telling you something, it's no secret, guys, that our world is filling up with the flood. And if you have not built an ark, guess what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. We're not going to make it because we won't be able to swim in something like that. So my point, what I want to talk about this morning is building an ark. So that when the floodwaters are poured out, because they are being poured out right now. They are being, guys, it's not getting any easier to live in this world. It's not getting any easier to live in this world. It's getting tough. You need the light of God to be able to, to navigate you through the course of life. You see, the thing about Noah that I love is that Noah, we look at this big boat and we go, yeah, he built that. And the Bible talks about how he built it out of gopher wood, how he was supposed to make it 300 cubits uh, long, a certain height, put this many windows in it, etc., etc., etc. But one day, I was seeing the Lord and the Lord said to me, he showed me this, and he also showed me the temple, the tabernacle where God would dwell. He said, Brandon, the, the man-made materials that I said to use, yeah, they have a purpose, but the underlying thing is that the ark and the temple were not built by man-made things. They were built by every word that came out of my mouth. Uh -huh. So if God says to use gopher wood, by God, I find gopher wood and I use it. It's not about the local one, it's because it's God said to. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? This is how you build an ark. You don't build it by man-made raw materials. You build it by hearing the voice of God. Yeah. And then being obedient to the point of living with substance in your life. Faith, hope, and love. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. See, when was the last time we actually heard God to take us from the place of where we're at into a place of where we need to go? See, some of us, we built a quarter of an ark. But let me tell you something. A quarter of an ark does not sail in the midst of a storm. Half of an ark does not build in the midst of floodwaters. You still will sink. What does that mean? This means that we should be building an ark for the rest of our life. 
until Jesus comes, and who I believe is the floodwaters. I believe New Testament is the it's the it's the truth, it's the person of His Holy Spirit invading the earth. Why do I say that? We live in a country right now where Christians are being opposed, not to a level of crazy physical persecution. I think maybe sometimes, but I mean. It's being kicked out of schools, it's being kicked out of places, etc. Why do you think that is? Many people see that and they say, well, we're just becoming an unchristian nation. But let me tell you what I see. Can I tell you what I see? Yes, sir. That's called opposition. And opposition only happens when the power of the Word of God is released. That means we're doing something right. Mm. That means we're doing something right. Come on. See, those of you who have this perspective are building an ark. If you don't have this perspective, you're drowning by life circumstances. You see, the greater the opposition, I'm telling you right now, in this in, in the United States, do you understand? Do you do you believe that there are godly men and women in the United States right now? Yes, sir. Who literally have a relationship with Jesus, who hear the word of the Lord and release it into the air. Don't you believe that? Yeah. Yes. Let me tell you something. It's being released powerfully. And there is great opposition against it. But Isaiah 55 tells us that the word of the Lord will never return to void. That it will fulfill the purposes that it's set forth to do. Yeah. Amen. Yes. You see, Noah's account is a prophetic picture of the life of a son of God, a son or daughter of God. Those who will be saved by grace through faith. You see, those who are saved by grace through what? Faith. Faith. Through what? Faith. 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 Faith is evidence in the substance of the things no. that I hope for. It's substance and evidence. In other words, if you say you believe, that means you act this way. That means if I say I'm, you know, I believe this and I believe that, the evidence of that is there's actually substance and evidence of me believing something. So faith is putting ourselves, it's living with, with purpose every single day. Every single day. It's called being faithful. And some people, when we meet Jesus, we come and it sounds all great, and we see what he has to offer us on a platter, and we begin building our heart. But as soon as the first flood hits, or as soon as, soon as the first, that first bad thing happens, that's what we do. We forget. We stop remaining faithful. We why? Because we lose hope. You see, faith is the evidence and the substance of things what? Hope for. Faith and or faith and hope have to be tied together. So when God comes to you during the worship set and he gives you these glorious pictures of everything that your life can be, of everything that your home can be, of everything that CLA can be, of everything that your job place can be, of everything that your family can be, of everything that all these different places can be, guess what he's designed that to do? He's designed that to give you hope. So that you might live according to that hope. Meaning my family may not be manifesting godliness at this point, but my hope is that it will. So what do I do? I will sit down with them and read the Bible with them. We will pray together. Even if my kid doesn't want to, guess what? I still have a hope and I will live with substance and evidence according to what I believe. Amen. That's called building an art. And eventually, in just a minute, guess what? What? Jesus, or I'm sorry, the Father releases power. Amen. And all of a sudden, what was chaos now becomes substance. It becomes reality. And the thing that which you hope for now, guess what? You've been given a gift. But see, how many times do we try to fill the holes in our own life as opposed to just simply waiting on the Holy Spirit to speak to us? Because once He speaks and you step into obedience, all the holes in the life that you just saw now become healed. healed. Yes. See, that's leadership. When you are a leader, let me tell you something, and you're growing, you're going to see flaws first. You're going to see where you fall short first. Personally, family-wise, in any organization that you lead, you're going to see your weaknesses first. That's why we get stretched. Because guess what? The glory has come to us and showed us what it should look like. And we go, oh, my God, it doesn't look like that. But we want it to, right? Because for people of God, we want these things to look like that. But let me tell you something. He shows us what they should look like so that he can actually give those things to us. Amen. That's a promise. Yeah. That's a wonderful promise. But until then, you've got 
to spend some money. And I don't mean money, I mean faith. I mean, you got to stay faithful. Faith is the currency of heaven. When you stay faith, faithful, eventually you're going to push through and you're going to unlock the blessings of heaven. Amen. Amen. And that authority that you've been looking for is going to come in the form of God's word. Woo. See, it come, see, we spend so much time on trying to patch our own lives up. And we focus on a million different things because how many of you guys know that there's a million different things wrong with our lives? <laughs> just, just saying. Uh -huh. we're, not, we're not perfect people. There are a hundred things going on in our lives and in the things that we lead all the time. And it's very easy as human beings to start getting the duct tape out and start going after those things and putting a patch on them. But the, you know what the, the response should be? Seek, the, seek Jesus. You seek the Word of God. You seek the Word of God. You seek the Word of God. And when you see, and then you live in faith, by putting, by, by substance and evidence of the things that I believe, guess what? In a minute, His Word releases to you. And now you've got a new authority, a new glory, and your ark is being built strong. So that when the winds and the waves come, it, nothing can happen to you. Amen. It'll be on top. You'll be right. Ooh, this is good. You'll be rising above the circumstances. Amen. Come on, man. Woo! That's the life of a believer. That's the life of a believer. We should be rising above circumstances. And the circumstances should literally be taking us there. Woo! Come on, man. That's good right there. A lot of us think we're doomed because of our circumstances. How about letting your circumstances propel you and work for you? In Jesus' name. Amen. So who is Noah and what does it mean for us? Noah, we need to understand something. Noah was he was a man. He was he was he was a sinner. He was a he was a guy, he was a drunken guy. At one point, scripture says was, his sons found him, or his son found him in his tent naked, drunk on wine. Noah wasn't a perfect person. But it said this, that Noah sought the Lord and that the Lord found favor on him and, he said, and, he, and, he, and, and that Noah was a righteous man. You see, Jesus is pointing to something. God's painting a picture. You see, grace through faith is what saves us. And this account of Noah is what we need to be looking at. Romans 10, 17 says this, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So we know that because Noah built the ark, that he heard the word of God. God spoke to him. He talked to him. He had hope. He saw a day that was coming. How many understand that God's people are meant to be prophetic? What I mean by that is God always wants to prepare you for what's coming. But you cannot be prepared unless you see. Guys, I'm not talking fireballs and different stuff like that, you know, at the end of the world. I'm talking about step by step. He wants to show you what's coming. He wants to prepare you for it. He wants to prepare you for it so that when you step into it, the resistance that comes, because every time you take new territory, there will be resistance. And there will be opposition. This church is in the middle of that. See, challenge is in the middle of that. My family is in the middle of that. How do I know that? Because opposition tells me so. But because I see that, I know there's only one response. Thank you, Jesus, for the opposition. You're going to build a testimony that will reveal your power, not my power. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for building an ark in my life so that when the flood rains come, I will not be taken. I will be in the ark of salvation. Amen. Amen. Literally just floating. Noah chose to walk with God. And found favor in his eyes in a time where wicked men only did wicked all the time. That's what the scripture says. Wicked men only did evil all the time. Genesis 6 5 says that. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Can you imagine that? The world being only evil continually. But there's one righteous man. And it's very important that we understand what Noah's times were like because, guys, you can see the times that we're headed to right now. And I'm not, like I said, I'm not trying to be an end times guy, but man, I am alert to these things because I want to build an ark. Listen, your, your body is an ark. 
for your family. This church is an ark for many families. We're building our, we're building our lives on the Word of God. This church is being built on the Word of God. Amen. It's being built on the Word of God. That's why we don't do anything with haste. You don't just do something because other people are doing it to look like a church. You don't do anything until the Holy Spirit speaks. Right. Nothing. And he, when he speaks, he floods you with peace. How do I know when God speaks to me? Because he will flood you with peace. And you will feel confident and joyful and super excited about what to do. Yeah. It won't be this, well, should I or should I not? You're going to know because Jesus is, doesn't, he doesn't make things complicated. So what was it like in Noah's time? We just talked about the direction that the world is heading. We live in times where men are calling good evil and evil good. Mm. Isaiah 5, 5 uh, chapter 5, verse 20 says this. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Man, come on, guys. We know we are living in the days of Noah. Our government, listen, I'm not, I'm not for talking, I'm for speaking the truth, and so I'm not trying to call anybody out. So hear my heart of love, please. If we're not awakened to the truth, then we'll never understand. We'll get swept away with the rest of the world. But man, our, our government, our, our schools, our, man, this, we are trying to kick God out of here. We are trying to call good evil and evil good. We are literally trying to do this. And for you and I as the believer, that's very important because we're either going to go along with the majority or we're going to hear the voice of the Lord with the minority. You have to really want God. You have to really want His way because there's millions of distractions and all of them please the flesh. All of them satisfy the wisdom of man. All of them satisfy the arrogance of what we think is right in our opinion. But the only one's opinion that matters is the truth of God. Amen. And it must always weigh against what the world is saying. Guys, we have to be people of prayer. I'm just saying this, this, is, this is a call, man. I'm telling you right now. We've got to be people of prayer. We've got to be people with our ears inclined to heaven. We've got to hear what he's saying. We can no longer settle for anything less than the word of God manifesting in our families. If there isn't peace there, if there's, if there's chaos in areas of our life, we cannot settle for it because that is the thing that will be shaken when this thing happens. You must have peace in areas of life. If you don't have them, then you pursue peace. And then you have faith and walk out with evidence and substance. Amen. Are you with me this morning? Yes. Long after Noah, what did Jesus say about what the times would be like before he returned? Now listen to this. This is scripture, Matthew 24, 36 through 42. He says this. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah's were, Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man to be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also the coming of the Son of Man will be. Man, I can read that again. There's some power words. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. couple of verses I want to point out in that real quick. For as in the days of before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. People were sitting there appetizing their flesh, worried about what they wanted to do, just eating, drinking, confident in their own wisdom, confident in the comfortability of life. Let me tell you something. If you're going to walk with Jesus, it's not comfortable. It's victorious, and it's yes and amen, but it ain't comfortable. You can't have faith. You can't embark in new adventures of faith and be comfortable. Do you understand what I just said? You cannot.
not in, you cannot go after the word of God in something that's not in your life now and not step into uncomfortableness. If that's even a word. Uncomfortableness. Uncomfortability. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you get the contest, people. You know what I'm talking about. Talk to me. You cannot walk in comfort if you're gonna man, if you're going to live by the word of God. And listen to me, I might be crazy, but I look for opportunities to be challenged by his word. And man, let me tell you something, it hurts at times. Mm -hmm. It hurts, it's scary. It's um, um, I get afraid sometimes. Man, I, some of you have been asking about a trip, my trip to India, so I'll, I'll give a quick testimony real quick. Man, listen to me, I am a person, I'm not a perfect person by any means, but I am a person who loves God. And I, I am a person who has to have a life that has a testimony built on the impossible. If not, I'd rather not even be signed up for this thing. Because if I'm not pointing to a God, that is more powerful than myself, like I said earlier, then I'm not pointing people to, anybody, to anything other than myself. And so, when I went to India, we went to a city called Hyderabad. Hyderabad is, imagine a city of 11.4 million people. 11, no, hey, and no street, no street laws. No, no road signs. No, no red, no, no road lights. I mean, it's it's like it's like bees in a beehive. It's chaos. I'm sorry if that's not correct. If you're not in chaos, Tina, I'm sorry. Not chaos. chaos. But this was chaotic. 11.4 million people in the city. And when we got there, this is a this is a very predominantly Hindu region of our world. I mean, it's it's 90 percent. 85% Hindu, like 7% uh, Muslim, and the rest of it is whatever, and a couple percent Christians. So it was it was intense. No doubt. Because we were going to preach the gospel at a big, at a giant crusade where there was going to be hundreds of thousands of people. And as soon as we started getting there, there became there started to become threats against us, physical threats. Violent threats, etc. We're not going to let you have this thing here. It was the, it was a radical Hinduist group that was that was speaking out against us, and they were doing everything they could to get this thing canceled. Well, <clears throat> so what we did as a group is once we began to hear about this, we began to seek the Lord, and the Lord altered our plans because here's the reality of what we came into. There were pastors there that had to stay. And we figure, or wisdom says that we're going to leave a mess for them after we've done this thing. So let's not do that. I don't want them to be hurt because of our American arrogance to come in here and have to preach the gospel to all these people. Yes, you want to preach the gospel. At the same time, you want to be, you want to use wisdom and, and allow God to direct you. And so we figured if we went in there and caused a bunch of uh, and, and, and things went off in that crusade like people were threatening that it was going to leave a mess for these pastors. And they would probably catch it a lot worse than what they were. So as we sought the Lord in wisdom, we altered our plan. We, would, we decided that we were going to go into all the churches in the city of Hyderabad and that we were going to strengthen the church that was already there. Amen. That there would be lasting fruit. After gone, man, we were going to do um, it, what they talk about in Acts 12 by strengthening the faith of the disciples. Amen. We wanted to strengthen the church. They found out about that and they began to come against us even more. Mm. Even more. At one point, there was a pastor's conference that was going on at the same time that we were going to be teaching at. 4,000 pastors from across the country had been signed up for that thing. When the persecution hit, 100 stayed. There was 100 stayed in a building smaller than this. At this time, now listen to me, because I say this from a place of wanting to live the life of Jesus. Okay? Jesus went through some things. Jesus faced his fear with faith. He was wise, 
He did everything he said the heart saw the Father doing. He did everything. He said everything he said. I want to be like that. And I also want to be in scary positions so that I can live in faith. That's my mentality. That's what I look for. Just to share it with you a little bit. So here it is. 4,000 pastors had skid out of except for 100 faithful ones. At this point, we decided that we were going to drive four and a half miles or four and a half hours away into the remote villages and just preach the gospel there where there was less hostility. Felt like the city was literally trying to spit us out. It was crazy. No doubt. And so I met with our team leader. He called me in and he said, listen, 4,000 pastors, out of those 4,100 who left, they've all scattered. It, the heat's turned up. He said, these faithful ones, I'm going to go, I'm going to go preach to you. Do you want to go with me? He said, I'm not asking everybody, but I'm asking you because I know you've counted the cost. And without delay, I mean, fear gripped my heart, but I said yes. Because you honor faith by going. Yes. You honor the people by going. And then you see what the Father is doing, and you use the opportunity to step into a place of faith where you have to have courage, where you have to have faith, where a God that's bigger than you has to deliver you, otherwise you're not getting out of there. And you put yourself in these situations so that you can have a testimony, so that you can declare it from the rooftops, so that the masses can have, so that they can have hope in Jesus as well. And not only that, but so that you as believers can begin to be strengthened in your faith to go after things that you never thought you could. Or maybe the things that you've been scared of that you need to step into. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus will deliver you from it. Amen. If he says to go, you go. And this is the kind of discomfort that I'm talking about. This is a little bit different. This is, well, I see my family. This is what's going to happen. I'm just going to be honest with you with the type of thoughts I've had. I was happy. This is how is it going to end if it ends. Is it going to be painful? Is it going to be quick? I mean, but, but, you know, that's where, you, that's where your mind goes. But you don't. But at this moment, I saw one of the reasons why I went. Because God said to go. And I saw one of the reasons why I went was to go. And I said, yes. I said, man, I'm going. Let's go. Let's do this. God will be with us. And so we went and we preached. I preached for about an hour. Uh, our team leader came up afterwards, preached for about 20 minutes. After about 20 minutes, um, our security team that was with us, they were dispersed out into the parking lot because there were some groups starting to form, some hostility, some hostile crowds starting to to camp out and start raising, you know, raising a little bit of chaos. So we deployed them, and about 10 minutes later, another guy comes in and says, listen, you guys need to get out of here. And at this moment, you have, you're facing this way, your message, and you have a back door. That's all you got. And we decided beforehand that when we went, we were not, we were going regardless of the cost because we felt like this was what we were supposed to do. So, in the midst of that, we had a settled congregation down say, listen, let's not get in a panic here. Let's, let's focus our eyes on Jesus. And, we began, and our team leader prompted us to just begin to pray. And I got on my knees to eliminate my humanness from looking at the back door. Because yes. I didn't want to see what was coming in, nor did, I, nor did I want to head for help. So I dropped to my knees to eliminate my, my peripheral vision, my vision to only Jesus. And we didn't pray in fear, fear. We just said, we just began to worship Jesus. You know what worshiping Jesus is just, as you look at it, you, you just declare your heart to him. God, thank you. We love you. You're amazing. You're awesome. We bless you. You're, that's worshiping Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. You're amazing, Jesus. And in about five minutes, I don't, well, I said I don't know what happened, but something supernatural happened. It felt like Jesus walked into the room. There was this, literally, this blanket of peace that literally just came and melted over all, every single one of us. Then I got up, and I sat down, and the place was dead peaceful. 
It was unreal. We didn't even know what was going on outside. We just knew everything was going to be okay. And we preached and we strengthened the church. We laid our hands to everybody. A black man, man's eyes were open, which was amazing to see. That was my first time ever seeing something like that. So that was awesome. And then we got out of there without being harmed. In fact, we didn't see anything. Oh. Now, I don't know what to tell you about all that. <laughs> I really don't. I don't know how all the details showed up. I don't even know. All I know is that Jesus makes a way. Yeah. He's the only one to build your life on. And he's raising up a generation of believers who will, who will dare to live with faith, who will dare to live with hope so that they can be rewarded with love. You see, in that, it's a crazy mentality. Once you get a hold of the gospel, the mentality goes kind of crooked. You stop looking for comfort, you start looking for discomfort. You start looking for situations that the Lord's leading you into that only takes His hand to be able to accomplish. And then you start liking that kind of stuff. You know what? I'm going to be scared again in my life because I want to be in a situation where it requires faith and it requires God to get me out of it. Why? Because I want to tell you about it. I want you to understand that it's His power and it's His love who saves us. It's going to take that for the building of our church, for the building of our lives. You really want to know God? we got to get uncomfortable. we got to live by faith and start building our So we live in these times where faith is required, where all kind of stuff is going on in this world, all kind of stuff. And the only thing that I can tell you that matters is what God is saying, is what is he saying. That's the only thing that matters. Nothing else matters. What is he saying and how do we obey it? And then do we have the faith? Because I'm telling you right now, it's going to take that type of faith. And, and honestly, guys, that's nothing. It, it needs to be more than that. There needs to be an increase. I'm just saying, it's going to take that type of faith to, 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 to survive in the world that's coming. To survive in the times that we live in. It's going to take a fearless, courageous faith. Because eventually, the heat is going to be so hot where you have one choice. You step into the fire or you run out. You understand what I'm saying by that? We either going to step into the fire or we run out of the fire. And the fire is only going to get crunk up, guys, because the word of the Lord is being released in power. And it's having its way amongst its people. It's purifying its bride as we speak. That's why it's happening, guys. You see God's perspective in this? Do you see your role in this? Do you see why you need faith? Do you see why we must hear God's voice? Do you see why we must build an ark? Because it's coming. And I hope, I, I, hope, I pray that this resonates with us. In other words, all of those who are concerned with pleasing themselves more than hearing and living by the word and faith will be left, will be swept away. In the, la in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. We can be on fire, we can praise Jesus with our hands up in our air, but can we live the life? Can we live with substance and evidence? Team Challenge, guys, when you go and you sign up for Team Challenge and you begin the year-long process, can you endure? Because the ark is being built if you say yes. Church family, you're no different. You've been here. You've been faithful for years. Some of you have been here since the beginning of this church. Why would you stick around if you didn't believe something great was coming? Amen. Some of you were here when a bunch of people left years ago. Some of you are still here. Why? You're building an ark. You're faithful. You're enduring. You're building your life on the word. That's why, guys, you and Teen Challenge, you need to understand that. You're in a program, but it's not a program. It's God's program. It's His will. Amen. He's, he's wanting to speak to you while you're here. Mm. He's wanting you to build your life. Because if you leave Team Challenge, you're leaving into the midst of a storm. Do you understand that? 
You're going in the midst of the world that's going to eat you alive. The only safe place to be is God. Yes. That's the only safe place to be. In the will, in the word. He says, go, you go. And you stay faithful until the job is done. And you don't move. That's how you build an ark. No one didn't build an ark in one year or one day. Historians say they built it in between 40 and 100 years. That's a big span of time. But how many of you have stayed faithful for, on doing something for 40 years? There's not a whole lot of that. There's not a whole lot of that. Can we build the ark? If you started building it, keep building. If you need to start, let's start today. Amen. Couple more of this. You guys with me? Yes, sir. You good? Okay. Teach you a little bit now, so I'm not. I just want to get this. All right, I want us to get this. Because Noah walked by with God by faith, God gave Noah the words of life. Doesn't Jesus say that in the scriptures that I am the words of life? I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. How are you going to know that way if you don't hear His word? He gave Noah words that would save him and his family. God, God gave Noah salvation by grace and faith. So in this, of this, what are our choices, guys? What is our choices as we are confronted by truth? What are our choices? We live in a world where wickedness is beginning to spread, where it's consuming all areas of life. Here are your choices. We have the temptation to conform to the world, world or we have the opportunity to live fearlessly in faith. Mm -hmm. That's your two choices. You're going to conform to the world, or you're going to live fearlessly in faith. Fearlessly means not absent of fear, but with fear, but stepping into courage. Understand? <laughs> Temptation also draws name around as if I'm in the family, yet there is no fruit in my life. Instead, I settle comfortably in the lies I tell myself as to why I'm a good Christian and do a bunch of, bunch of good, dead works to justify myself. Or, see, you can choose to do that. Or, you can choose. Now, this is sharp, okay? So, I, I don't apologize for the sword that's out right now. Or, you live in faith. You be fruitful and you multiply. You constantly take an honest look into the mirror of the Spirit of God and accept nothing less than becoming like Him. You live a life of repentance. You understand? An honest look in the mirror. Where's my life? In closing, I just want to give the five things that Noah did to build this up. And I'm done. I promise you. <laughs> Number one is Noah sought God. Are we, are we actively seeking Him? Prayer time. Devotion to the Word. Fellowship with one another. Intercession. Intercession for our, our, our families, our ministries, and all that's part of our life. Do we seek God? Number one, Noah sought God. Number two, Noah heard God. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. It's not a mystery. It's not something we have to wonder if he'll speak to us. When we look at him, he will speak to you. The key is seeking him, looking at him, and waiting on heaven to speak to you. And he promises he will. Noah sought God. Noah heard God. Number three, Noah believed God. Don't you imagine there was days when Noah woke up and he's got a He's got a, his ark is built eight of the way. And the Lord's like, all right, Noah, here we go. Go grab some gopher wood. <laughs> For this section of the boat, we're going to cut the planks 13 foot by 2 foot. And we're going to use these type of screws or these type of nails that we're going to make out of the toenails of an aardvark. I mean, I mean, I don't know what they use. I have no idea. <laughs> Rocks? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. What the, the point is, is that when Noah woke up, Noah had to hear how to build that ark every single day. 
He had to hear what size the planks of the wood was going to be. Uh. He had to keep trying. He had to work in the rain. He had to work in tough circumstances. He had to work while the way that the world was wicked around him, trying to tell him, he said, dude, what are you doing, man? You're building an ark. This world doesn't even have water on it. Or no, I'm sorry, that's not true. Was it rain? I don't think rain. Rain had never come in. It had water. It had rain. Like flood? What do you mean to build the ark because of the flood? There hasn't, what is rain? Imagine that, man. He's building an ark. Every single day, get up. What do you do? Faith. 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 Building. Building. Seeking. Seeking. Hearing. Believing. Believing. Noah. Four. Number four. Noah continually believed. Faithfulness. Faith and, faith and hope create faithfulness. No one sought God, no one heard God, no one believed God, no one continued continue to believe God. The number in the last one, Noah and his family received from God. Yeah. Noah, the scripture says this, guys, now do the search for yourself. That Noah and his family went into the ark and God sealed them in there. Now Noah was the one who was found righteous, but his righteousness saved his family. Come on, you need to study that out because there's a promise there for your family if you're worried about your children. Seek the Lord, hear from the Lord, believe in the Lord, continue believing in the Lord, and then receive from Him. Amen. This time I want to ask the band to come. Some of you are in specific places of life. Listen to me. I'm going to hit a, a variety of people in here. If you've never, if you, if you say, Brandon, you know what? I didn't even know about the ark. I didn't even know about Jesus. I didn't know that I could hear from him. I didn't know his spirit could live in me. I didn't know I could live an overcoming life. I didn't know these things. In just a minute, as the band plays, I'm going to stand right here. And if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to, I want to pray with you. I want to talk to you. I want to, I want to, I'd love to pray with you and minister to you. Don't leave here without knowing that you have received Jesus into your heart. Amen. Number two is, you started building an ark. But you stopped building because it's gotten too hard. You started building an ark, but you stopped building because the circumstances got too hard. Maybe you were influenced by family or, or what God was asking you to do was much too hard. Maybe you couldn't forgive. Maybe, maybe you couldn't, maybe you couldn't, you know, do whatever God's tempted you to do. Some of you in here, you, you started building, but you stopped. Maybe you couldn't confess a sin that's been long and, and that's been resonating in your heart, that's been controlling your life all your life. And God's saying, I want you to get that out. Guys, I don't know what it is. Maybe you started building your heart and haven't finished that heart. And today's the day that you recommit. This is what the Lord is saying, and I'm going to do this regardless of the cost. Ushers, if I can have you come forward, we're going to take communion.